Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, a few days ago, we had a wonderful new, and I say new, new to me, plant-based physician on named Dr. Sandra Musil. She did a wonderful PowerPoint presentation telling her story. If you missed that episode, I'll link to it right below in the show notes and made her famous granola. Well, today she's brought back two friends and colleagues that are also new to me. They are plant-based doctors. They work together and they're called plant docs and their names are Dr. Sandra Musil, Dr. Stein and Dr. Lee. And please welcome them to the show. It's nice to meet this wonderful trio of plant plant-based doctors. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. How'd y'all get together in a, doing such a fun thing together? Well, um, I we're going to tell a little bit of story about how Plant Talk started when we do our slides, but um, I was looking for partners in crime to do this, to not do it by myself. <laughs> and Sue Yin and I were actually in a book club together and had no idea that we had this common interest right. of food as medicine. Um, I don't remember how that came to light. Yeah, um, I think I, you know, Steve and I, I were in a practice together and we had talked about doing plant-based, um, you know, clinical work, you know, mm -hmm. teaching our patients how to become plant-based to treat um, chronic diseases. And we were all kind of in a flux. And one day Sandy said, hey, I'm kind of starting this program. Are you interested? Um, and I was like, Oh my God, like it was like fate. It brought us together. It was somebody was sort of, you know, do, doing the knobs and it brought us together to start this program. And we got a, we got our plant docs company together in like what, three months? Yeah. Now, were you guys all plant docs before? In other words, were all three of you plant based? And this was just kind of a coincidence that you were friends and colleagues? I think we were all interested yeah. in plant-based approaches to treating our patients. I mean, I had gone, I personally had gone to some conferences um, when I, you know, back, you know, Neil, Neil Barnard's conferences, and um, we went to a lifestyle medicine yeah. conference together. So we had each individually sort of taken interest. You've been doing nutrition-based right. uh, for years, um, Sandy. So it all kind of, it all coincided with the opening of this really great plant-based food hall in Providence. So it all kind of came together really nicely. Right. That's amazing. <laughs> now, what are your specialties, each of you, in medicine? I'm um, I'm a family medicine um, physician. Um, I've been in practice twenty three years. Yeah. Also, also certified in lifestyle. We'll be certified in lifestyle. To be certified yeah, in lifestyle medicine. Certified, yeah. Right. yeah. And, oh, go ahead. Um, I was going to say I'm a pediatrician by training, but um, also got board certified in obesity medicine, and I plan on doing the lifestyle medicine. Um, as well. You know, pre pretty soon we're going to need obesity specialists for pediatrics. It's unfortunate. Yeah. But it's we already do it. Yeah. 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 And you, and you, Dr. Stein, what's your specialty? So I'm, I actually work in the same office with Dr. Lee, uh, family medicine. And I also do a couple other things on the side, some hospice, some Botox, you know, a little. Oh little my God. Well, just, oh. <laughs> do, now, um, do each of you have a plant-based story like Dr. Musial? She did a wonderful presentation of how she became plant-based, why and when to either, you don't have to do a whole PowerPoint, but do either of you have a little story about how you got interested? I went um, to a conference, um, I went with Steve and another, um, one of our other partners, and I was sort of blown away because we don't get this in medical school. We don't get it in residency. And it was sort of very, very eye-opening for me. Um, and that was back in 20, I believe 2017, 2018. Yeah. And, and I said, I want to do this in my practice. Like, how do I get people to do this so they can control their diabetes and their hypertension and high cholesterol? And, mm -hmm. and to be fair, I said, well, I can't ask them to do it if I'm not doing it. So I decided to transition. Um, took me about six months. I wasn't one of those people that said, okay, starting today, I'm not going to eat any animal products. I kind of transitioned and um, took me six months and I felt much better. I mean, I'm healthy, but after doing it, it was, it was sort of like, oh, this is not that bad. It's easy. We can do it. But I remember the one thing she yeah. said, I could not give up cheese. Right. <laughs> and so I had them over and, and served this platter of all plant-based cheeses and hors d'oeuvres. Yeah. And she was like, hmm could do this, could do this. Yeah. yeah. I always wonder because, you know, doctors obviously are smart. You have to be, to, I mean, even, even, I mean, even just to get into medical school, you have to be smarter than the average bear. And yet when it comes to nutrition, I don't, I'm not saying they're not smart, but it, so many of them just 
it's not even in their wheelhouse. You know what I mean? Well, I think it doesn't, you know, to, to uh, Sue's point, we don't get taught a lot of about, you know, actual, we get stuff about a little bit about nutrition and metabolism, et cetera, in med school, but we don't understand the way people eat and how the, you know, how to change the people's relationships with food, which are very important, um, you know, so I think it's true. Do you think it would help if, if this was a, like, a, like a mandatory curriculum in medical schools? Because my understanding, both my brothers are doctors and I have like 13 cousins and nieces and nephews and some even recent graduates. And they say they really didn't learn anything about nutrition in medical school with the exception of like if somebody's a burn patient, they need maybe more calories or pregnant, that, that kind of thing. And they mm -hmm. said, even when you take the boards, what you did learn on nutrition, it's not even, you don't, you're not tested on it. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. And it's, you certainly, and you certainly don't learn how to put it into practice with, right. with day to day with your patients. It, right. And it's really the board questions drive what's being taught in the curriculum because everyone wants their students to be A plus students. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the board questions mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to reflect mm -hmm. what's right. been important. With so patients. really, med medical school seems to be more about like treating disease rather than uh, preventing it and reversing it. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there's a huge medical industrial complex. And it's very hard to get traction on, you know, curricular things that aren't going to, you know, equal somebody being able to sell some huge product that's going to, or do some mm -hmm. procedure that's going to fix things. I've always said there's no money in kale. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be, I hate to sound cynical, but, you know, you, you kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, yeah, it's, it's just, it's unfortunate, but yeah, because I mean, it's true. We'll always need doctors, even if everybody went vegan. I mean, there's going to be accidents. There's going to be genetic things. I mean, people are going to get sick, but when you think about how much disease is chronic disease and could be avoided by a change in di diet and lifestyle, like I, I heard it like 70% or so. Yes. That's what I heard the same stat. <laughs> 70 yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. Well, I'm, I love that. I mean, and, and who to think funk in such a small state, you'd all have come together like this you know the other the other thing um uh, ha is that i've been doing this maybe 20 years you know primary care and you get tired after a while mm -hmm. and it's much it's you start to get a little bit of that burnout in your career and you know helping people really change their lives and feel better not just oh great i'm taking a cholesterol pill now my cholesterol is lower and i have diabetes but i'm taking all these medications and injections so now my sugar is better which is all very important stuff that we need to do, but you don't feel any better when you're taking all these medications. You don't feel more energy. You don't have- right. You just have better numbers. Just better yeah. numbers, right? And you're supposed to treat the patient, not the numbers. That's what we always learned. Yeah. I, well, it's, I, I, you know, everybody I know that's in lifestyle medicine and, or, plan, I mean, they, they feel like it's so gratifying what they do, especially if they practice the conventional way first where people weren't getting better. Absolutely. So that's- Gonna, um, if it's okay, share my screen now. We just have a little um, PowerPoint presentation to go over our programs that we've been running through Plant Docs. And then we have a little cooking demonstration. Wow. Um, I love this three for the price of one. <laughs> at 7 a.m., no less. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. Chef AJ. So this is our company, Plant Docs, um, with the tagline Real Foods Heal. And um, this is the three of us. So let's see. this is our favorite quote that we start all of our programs with. The food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine, or it can be the slowest form of poison by Ann Wigmore. And I know I said it at my last one, but it's just so important. It really kind of defines what we do because depending on your choice of food, it can be detrimental to your health as the standard American diet is proving with the um, epidemic of obesity and diabetes and heart disease, um, Cancer. cancers, um, inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases, or if you choose really super healthy foods, um, you know, you can be healthy. So every time you eat, you have a choice. They're kind of at a fork in the road. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And yeah, you can choose foods that are kind of we what we teach to our participants, like A through F is like our nice, simple way of looking for it. Um, and we're going to go over those. But like A foods are those that are fighting disease um, and boosting your immunity, maximizing your health, maximizing your body to be the best it can possibly be health wise so that it can function the best or um, feeding disease like F foods causing inflammation. So 
um, this is the field of food as medicine that um, we're practicing in our programs. And we're doing it at Plant City that was started by Kim Anderson, um, who's become a, a colleague and friend of ours. And it's the world's first plant-based food hall in the, in the world, but it's in our little state in Providence, Rhode Island. It's four restaurants, a marketplace, um, a coffee bar, uh, there's kombucha on tap. Um, All within and, under one roof. All under one roof. And in the basement is a cellar where there's um, community space um, that you can see in this picture where classes are run. So we're going to just go over what our Jumpstart Your Health program looked like before and after COVID. Um, so our program is called Jumpstart Your Health. And we started um, as a five week program and it was all live because this was before the pandemic. Um, we met each week um, and each class um, consisted of community building at the beginning um, where everyone would sort of introduce themselves and come with their goals, dreams, challenges, you know. Um, and then we had education um, by, you know, we did slide um, presentations, we had videos um, and then we did a cooking demo and a tasting. And we would, as you can see in the picture, we would cook whatever the recipe was for that evening. And then everyone would get a taste. Um, that's Steve and I, and then Ella, who was our um, Food for Life, Food for Life instructor. instructor. Yeah. And she was actually on your show earlier in the spring and yeah. referred us. She's great. Ella Rodriguez, yeah. She has amazing programs that she also runs out of um, Plant City. And then we also did blood work before and after um, the program, and we assessed for high cholesterol, you know, cholesterol panels, diabetic status, whether people had fatty liver disease, um, and then inflammatory state. Um, we did before and after weights. We checked their blood pressure and their body mass index. And then we also did weekly field trips. Um, and these were interesting because we would actually go as a group to a market and we would learn how to label read, um, nutrition labels. Um, we did exercises, we did meditation, we did walks. So every week it was something different, a different type of activity where we would put what we learned um, um, during the education portion, we would put it into practice. Um, and then we had an individual MD, a doctor consultation one-on-one -on -one before and after the program. And this is what makes our program different is that it's run by physicians. So it's not just, we're not just doing nutrition, education and cooking. We're also sort of assessing your health status um, during the program before and after. The whole cost was $350. Um, we really wanted to keep the cost down because we want this to be affordable to everyone. So people who couldn't afford that cost, you know, was a cost for supplies, foods, ingredients, and then nine, you know, meetings. Um, we had scholarships. Um, and then sometimes it could do like two for one if people couldn't afford it. So we really Tried wanted, to yeah, accessible. we wanted to make it accessible and affordable for lots of people. Mm -hmm. And so this was um, one of our jumpstart, smaller jumpstart classes in November. Um, and um, we ran, we were on our sixth jumpstart. And I just want to mention the little green boxes on the slides are testimonials from our participants along the way. Um, they're just little blurbs that I put on Instagram, but I just throw them on periodically. Um, and so during COVID, we kind of had this period of, of dormancy where we had to stop the classes and you know, then we got it, um, introduced to Zoom and we did a reevaluation and restarted up with a new program that was um, um, held partly, we called it a hybrid program, partly in Plant City Cellar, but that part we made it only um, educational, no more live cooking. Um, and Steve's going to so, go over the classes so post COVID. Jumpstart Your Health um, 2.0. <laughs> so this was post COVID. Um, we changed a couple of things. Obviously, we couldn't do everything we used to do live. We couldn't do the live cooking demonstrations in front of people. So we came up with this hybrid model where for the first and the last of the four classes, we did meet live, we did a lot of education. Um, we did some slide presentations. We did some looking at foods and stuff and reading labels together. But for the middle two classes, number two and three, we did a hybrid where we had all the participants prep all the ingredients at home that we were gonna use for that class's dishes. And in the second class and the third class, so the three of us would get together here and we would have our participants online and we would all cook together, um, answer questions as we went. It was really a ton of fun. We would make a breakfast option, a lunch option and a dinner option all in the hour and a half class. Um, and then we would all, you know, people would be eating, you know, 
tasting as they were going and then tasting the dishes after they were done. And it was a lot, a lot of fun. So we did, we did it that way with two live, two remote. Um, and we did a lot of the same blood work. We were able to still do the MD consultations, et cetera. We did the weights before and after. We lowered the price a little bit, obviously, because it was uh, virtual, but um, it was very successful. People had a lot of fun and getting people to be hands-on and actually go to the-, the It worked and, out yeah, better, yeah. Go, go to the supermarket, not, not just watch us prepare the kale, but actually have to go and get the kale and perfect, you know, it's, it's a big step to get people over that hump of like, I've never bought kale and done anything with it before or tofu yeah. or whatever. And now they have to do it. And, you know, not everybody loved everything, but for the, for the most part, people definitely benefited. Yeah, they were definitely empowered by the cooking. And that was the feedback we got. So we decided to um, keep that as a permanent model. So mm -hmm. we're just going to share with you some of the tools we share with our participants. So the first um, tool that we sort of um, talk about is Dr. Barnard's power plate, Neil Barnard. Um, he's a physician. He started the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine down in DC. And he's a big guru in the plant-based lifestyle medicine field. Um, so he came up with this power plate and each meal that you eat, um, you should use this plate as a guide and divide it into fours, you know, quarter fruit, quarter grains, whole grains, quarter vegetables, and quarter legumes. And if you eat this way, you will get all the nutrition that you need for the day. Um, and this, it, it's an easy guide to use because you don't have to like, you know, measure things. You can just say, oh, I had my quarter of fruit and quarter of grains and quarter of vegetables and quarter of beans. So it's an easy tool to guide you. Mm -hmm. And we also um, teach healthy fats through nuts, seeds, flat ground, flax seed, mm -hmm. olives, and no oil, no, no um, processed foods. And this is another tool that we use. This is the A through F food grading system. Um, and it basically, you know, I'm not going to read all the list of, of uh, food uh, categories there, but it basically starts with foods that basically are as they are, as they grow out of the ground or off the tree or whatever, however they, uh, you know, come to be unprocessed. Um, unprocessed. So, um, and as you move from the most unprocessed, you know, natural whole food uh, state down through these grades, you see the you think in each step, you kind of get a little bit more processing, a little more, more additives to the foods, um, a little more addition of animal products like, you know, dairy, eggs, uh, butter, cheese, et cetera, uh, meats, fishes. And then oils, you can see category C there, oils, the so things that are extracted from the, from, the, from the foods. We want to eat the whole foods. And that takes you all the way down to category F, which is your really stuff that you, you know, should really, really avoid at all costs. You know, fast foods, fried foods, French fries. It's kind of nice that they all start with F. That's just coincidence. <laughs> but um, those are the foods you don't want to so eat. So we try to say, you know, try to eat from the A, B category right, right, right. and minimize the C, D, F. And then another tool is the, um, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen. It's an app that's free on your phone that's accessible to anyone, but it's a great guide for someone who's kind of new to this and to try to get everything you need. If anyone's worried about getting enough X, Y, or Z, calcium or nutrients, if they're doing this, they're getting it. You don't need to weigh anything or measure or count calories. You just need to eat from all these nutritious foods and you'll feed your body the fuel it needs to heal itself. Okay, and then the other um, skill that we try to teach um, during the program is about label reading. And, you know, label reading is can be difficult for people who are not used to doing this. Um, you know, the boxes, first of all, the letters and boxes are so tiny. And, and that's, there's a reason for that, because the manufacturers who put these um, labels on do not want you to read it because they don't want you to see all the bad ingredients that they put into um, their um, processed foods. So, but sort of the down and dirty, like easy rule for label reading when you go to the store. So um, when you look at the ingredient list, the first three ingredients should not have any oil, sugar, or refined flour. Um, if, if you see any of those, if you see any kind of oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, coconut palm, oil, palm oil. palm oil, or any sugar, you know, um, glucose, dextrose, anything that ends in os or any kind of flour, get rid of it, put it back on the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, another quick rule, the 336 rule, okay? And these refer to the fat, the fiber, and the sugar content in, your, um, in the food that you're going to buy. So it should be less than three grams of fat per serving, greater than three grams of fiber per serving, and less than six grams of sugar per serving, okay? So 336 rule. 
And then the amount of sugar that's in, um, in a serving, um, it's really hard to imagine what a gram or five grams of sugar is. Imagine the volume of it. So what you're going to do is you're gonna take the number of grams of sugar and divide that by four so that you get the number of teaspoon per, of sugar per serving. Cause you could see you what two teaspoon yeah. is, but you can't you know, visualize five grams. grams of sugar, right? right. And the other thing is the note serving size. Yeah. And that most foods that have labels on them are questionable to begin with anyway. So just wanted to say that. So another tool we do is we do menu planning because people, you know, are making big, our participants are making big transitions from, uh, from pre, uh, pre being uh, plant-based to being plant-based. And it's, it can be very difficult to imagine, walk out and think, geez, what am I gonna eat for breakfast? What am I, I mean, people are eating, you know, people eat eggs for breakfast and, you know, Subway sandwiches for lunch and all this stuff. And they're like, geez, what am I gonna eat? So we, we do this thing where we divide everybody into three groups and each of us um, goes with each one of the groups. And then we, we talk about breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then we rotate. So the breakfast person goes to the next group. And then this um, slide shows you some of the, some of the things that we can use as kind of jump off points to try to find things that people will like to eat. So if somebody loves eggs, maybe we'll focus on the tofu scramble. If somebody loves um, potatoes, like home fries and, and red, we'll do something with home fries and veggies that can be prepared, low oil, et cetera, et cetera. That's our menu plan. We, we want people to leave feeling like they're ready to go. So um, we wanted to share with you some of the results from our Jumpstart Your Health programs. We've run 12 of them so far and we've probably about 160 people have gone through. Um, and I just wanna stress that what we're teaching and our goal is about health, not about weight loss, even though this is the first thing I'm gonna share. So it's not like a weight loss clinic and the goal isn't weight loss. The goal is getting healthy. The goal is learning to eat whole food, plant-based, no oil to be the healthiest person you can be. And to feel better. And weight loss is a side effect. You know, if you're heavy, you'll, you'll lose weight. So the average weight loss for everyone in the program with, that we have before and after weights on and I just wanna explain in parentheses where it says N equals a number, that's the number of people that contribute to that data. So we have 104 people that we have before and after weights on. And, and I just also wanna mention, this is not published and we haven't evaluated the statistics of this yet, although this is in the process and we're planning on we're hoping to publish this so that um, you know, we can get the word out on the success of the program. So um, the average weight for everyone was four pounds, but if people had a BMI over 30, which is the definition of obesity, the average weight loss was five pounds in the month. And this is actually perfect. It's what we want as physicians for the healthiest weight loss is like a pound a week. So um, the second data I wanna share is about total cholesterol, which is kind of all the different lipids in your body added up together. And, you know, you want it under 200. The average cholesterol drop for everyone was 25 points. And the average cholesterol drop for people who started with an elevated cholesterol over 200 was 38 points. It's a big drop in one month. And then I have this biggest loser category um, because our goal is really to make these kinds of numbers drop, not, not the focus on weight. So the biggest loser of everyone that's gone through our program had dropped their cholesterol 119 points. LDL is your bad cholesterol. So in this picture, it's the yellow blobs. The, the good cholesterol is your HDL. That's kind of helps to clear your arteries out. But the bad cholesterol, your LDL, contributes to initially fatty streaking that eventually leads to plaque buildup and hardening of the arteries or coronary artery disease that blocks the flow of blood in your vessels. Heart disease, angina, all those things. Stroke. Stroke. Yeah. So the average LDL mm -hmm. drop for everyone was 10. And the, and the average LDL drop for those with an elevated LDL over 100 was 22 points. And how does that compare to like statins? statins? I think statins basically will drop your LDL about 30%. So we stop starting at 100 and you know, with your LDL, it'll drop into the, into the 60s. So you can see this is not far off. Um, but there's also intangible benefits of eating this way that, you know, that statins don't give you. And, and statins often make you side, side effects. effects and yes. people. I mean, statins, you know, not to get it, not to get, not to miss the point that statins are actually an amazing, uh, you know, medical contribution to decreasing heart disease and death and stroke, et cetera. Um, but we have to look at some other uh, approaches as well for some, for the appropriate patients. Yeah. 
And people that do this can avoid going on statins and can lower their cholesterol and LDL. So the biggest loser with the LDL was 92 points. And then triglycerides was another data point. Um, the average triglyceride drop for those with elevated triglycerides was 22 points. And triglycerides are, are one of the, the lipids and the things that make it go up are alcohol, sugary foods, refined flours, and saturated and trans fats. So the biggest loser in, in, out of everyone had a 123 point drop, which is huge. And then I just wanted to share just background about why we're checking for fatty liver disease. There's um, uh, the normal livers on the left. And then at, if you eat too much fatty foods, um, not only do you get like fat tissue under your skin as you gain weight, but it also gets into your organs and your cells. So a fatty liver, um, if gone unchecked, will progress to this. This is a progression from healthy to fatty liver. It can become NASH and cirrhosis. And so all of the, so the fatty liver is reversible with diet, but cirrhosis is irreversible because it's scarring of your liver. So risk factors for this are um, too much fat, dietary fat um, that you eat, excess body weight, high cholesterol, um, and triglycerides, diabetes, or just bad genes. So we do um, screen for this by testing um, AST and ALT, and the average drop was 23 and 29 points out of the 14 people that had it before and after. So it is an effective way to treat fatty liver disease. And then another lab we check for is um, high sensitivity CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, and the high sensitivity one, the HS, is more specific to heart disease. And you really want it under one for the lowest risk, and for people that had it over three to begin with, the average drop was 2.5, which may not sound like a lot, but given how low the numbers are, it was- It can move you into a lower risk category. And then I just wanna talk about diabetes um, is also like a spectrum from insulin resistance where the cells aren't um, responding to the insulin. And I just wanna explain that because I think this is super, super important. Um, when you eat and it's broken down into glucose, which is the um, sugar, just our fancy word for sugar. The sugar needs to get into the cell and it needs to go through these purple receptors. Insulin is the key that lets the sugar into the cell. And in a normal function body, that works just fine. But if you have excess dietary fat, excess weight, the fat not only gets into your organs, but it gets into your cells. And that's what this yellow is. And it interferes with the body's ability to, um, to take on that glucose. So it ends up building up outside of the cells. And when that happens, it sticks to the red blood cells. And when we're- And then and other cells and damage them over time. Yeah. And so what, what we do to measure it is get a hemoglobin A1C. And some people just call it an A1C. And what we're looking for is how much glucose is stuck to those red blood cells. So the normal ones on the left and the abnormal ones on the right. And a normal A1C is below 5.7, that green zone on the arrow. Pre-diabetes is kind of starting to get diabetes, getting more insulin resistance. Your cells are not functioning properly, 5.7 to 6.4. And then when it's over 6.5, it's type 2 diabetes. And so we measure that. Um, we've had great success in reversing pre-diabetes. Um, some people found out they had it, didn't know they had it. Um, for people that came into our program with type 2 diabetes, we see better glucose control as early as the first or second week, um, less need for diabetes medication, and their A1Cs go down. So other subjective results, um, when people finish our program, they just feel better, they're sleeping better, they're less pain, they have improved bowel function, like less constipation, clearer skin. They like that they're, they can control something in their health, because so many times you feel like you can't, you just have to take a pill. Um, reflux gets better, more energy. So um, people really feel great when they do the program. So we're just going to go over some of um, our programs that are coming up. And then we're going to do our cooking, cooking. demo. Okay. So you've heard about the Jumpstart Your Health. That's sort of our main star of, um, of our plant docs um, programs. And um, we're doing two that's coming up September. Um, it'll be all remote. Sandy's going to be leading that one. Um, and then in October, um, it'll be the hybrid form um, where all three of us will be involved. We'll do the education classes live um, and then the cooking um, demos remote. Um, you can do that. You have the option to do it all remote if you're not in the Providence or Rhode Island area. Um, and 
again, if you have any problems, you know, being able to afford it, talk to us and we can work something out. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. And you can um, learn about all of our programs on our website at the bottom, plantdocspvd.com. Um, another program we're offering in um, October is specific to cancer survivors. Um, I just feel like there's a need to let cancer patients know that there is something, you know, diet is something they can control and does matter. And I feel like so often they're told it doesn't matter what you eat. And there are foods that have been shown that really help boost your immune system and help fight off camp cancer. So I have a class coming up in October um, that's called Jumpstart Your Health for Cancer Survivors. It's gonna be fully remote, so you can do it from home. It's only an hour long. It's gonna be a little bit of education about the food group, like one, one month um, week we'll do like mushrooms or the Allium family with like onions and garlic. And then the other half of it we'll cook with it. And together I'll share a recipe. So there's five different foods we'll focus on. And um, I also have a cooking class that we do every month by Zoom. Anyone can join in, just go on the website and we learn about why each ingredient and whatever we make is helpful. There's nothing bad in there, no oils, all whole foods, all AD foods. And I also offer private MD consultations um, that can be done remotely um, or if you're nice. local yeah. at Plant City, I have an office and they can be more specific if you have like, you want more intense, deeper dive one-on-one. -on -one. Um, mm -hmm. And? And Sue and I, uh, Dr. Lee and I work at Family Medicine Associates in Attleboro. We- um, That's in Mass, right over the border of Rhode Island. Um, and we love having patients come to us who are interested in hearing more about plant-based approaches to their health, yeah. so. That's us. All right. All right. Here's contact how you info. contact us. There's um, Plant Docs PVD. PVD is short for Providence. And that's our Instagram and, and Facebook handle as well at Plant Docs PVD. And our YouTube channel is Plant Docs, not to be confused with the guy who cures plants. <laughs> <laughs> So what we're going to make today is any bean, any green, any grain with a creamy um, lemon tahini cashew sauce. And Sue's going to start by just going over. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you some stuff. Now, now, do you want to take it off the slide so we can see you bigger? Or do you want to keep that? Yes, thank you. That graphic? Sure. <laughs> There's a few questions that came in, but we can catch them at the end if you like. Oh, so we have to fly through this. Okay. So um, we're doing... Um, the recipe is called any any uh, bean, any green, any grain. Okay, abigag. Um, abigag, <laughs> that's the. Uh, and um, this is a really good versatile recipe. We love it because you can substitute um, whenever you make it and make a different meal out of it. So any bean, um, and it can be either dry or canned. So this is um, a garbanzo bean. We have pinto beans. Cannellini, black bean, anything. We're using butter beans today. We're using canned butter beans. But I also want to give a, you know, um, a shout out to dried beans because you can batch cook these and freeze them, and it's really easy to do. You know, um, it does take a little longer to cook them, but um, if you batch cook it and put it in the freezer, it's really convenient in terms of coming home from work and then just putting it in the microwave. And then any um, any green, so. Here are our greens. And today we're gonna to be using Swiss chard, but you can use kale. You can use, this is a Napa Chinese cabbage, broccoli, baby bok choy, any green that you like. Um, and then any grain. So grains are a really important source of protein. Um, you wanna eat these, it's a good source of fiber. So today we're gonna to be using black rice, uh, which is really um, full of minerals and iron. Um, here's the black rice. And we've pre-cooked ours, but um, you can cook, you can substitute any grain. This is frika, millet, ground rice, and make sure it's whole grains. You, when you buy grains, make sure it says whole grains. Right. Okay. All right. All right so go. we're gonna start. There you go. Okay. A little more. There we we'll go. start with our cashew sauce. All right. Think, right. This sauce is amazing. Okay. So um, 
It's if you want a cheesy sauce for your um, your vegetables, you can put it in salad dressing, but we're going to use it for our um, our recipe today. So we're going to put in one cup of nut milk. OK, so. And this morning we um, we're making this basically it's the cashews and the nut milk that make the, the base of the sauce. So mm -hmm. we soaked our cashews for a couple of hours yeah. and we're going to add Raw a half cashews. a cup of um, cashews. And then we're going to add a little bit here, okay. a tablespoon of miso. And miso is a fermented um, soy. Um, it's an Asian um, paste. And the form of bean that we use in here, because if we're thinking about the power plate or the daily dozen. It's a little sticky. Yes. And then we're going to do a quarter cup of tahini. It doesn't usually take three people to do this, by the way. <laughs> yes. You can do this alone at home. <laughs> people. Yes. And they don't have to be medical doctors. They no. Don't have medical doctors. There we go. Tahini. Mill here. Tahini is a, a form of sesame. Ground, ground sesame yeah. seeds. And then we're going to do half the juice from half a lemon. So here's our lemon. You roll, roll it, it. Loosen up the juice. Let the juices get all activated in there. So believe it or not, I mean, I'm sure Chef AJ, your audiences, you know, know a lot of this stuff, but a lot of the participants in our program, it's the first time they're using any of these ingredients. And it's, you know, it, it is really a truly an education for them. Okay, so lemon juice. In. Lemon juice. And we're gonna do two or three tablespoons of nutritional yeast. Which is really yummy. It gives it this a nice gives it a cheesy, cheesy flavor, flavor and a lot of nutritious. Uh, but if you didn't do two, two, two. Oh, two, two. And if you don't like this, you could leave it out and have it be, you know, add more spices, have it be more savory. Mm -hmm. We're going to do half a teaspoon mm -hmm. of mustard. A little Dijon mustard. But you can use any mustard you like. And clove of garlic. Clove of garlic, we're just going to throw it in and there. And this is a high power, high speed blender. So um, if you have one that doesn't really totally pulverize everything, you might want to chop up the garlic or use a garlic So this press. is, you can add a quarter, a half teaspoon of turmeric. This is a great anti-inflammatory um, spice. Mm -hmm. And it's delicious. And, and it, you should have it every day. And it gives it like this great kind of creamy color. And then whenever you use turmeric, you always want to put in just you know a little, little bit, bit of black, black pepper. pepper. It increases the absorption by two thousand times. Cayenne pepper plus minus if you like it a little spicy. spicy or... And then you can leave out the salt if there's concerns with um, blood pressure, blood pressure, hypertension, or you can um, put it in. Yeah, the miso is going to give it some salt yeah. in this too, so. And then you yeah, blend her up. We're it. just gonna fat and see. It's gonna be a little loud, so ready? Not gonna be able to Okay, here we go. So I did that about 25 seconds. And it's so amazing. It comes out really creamy. Mm. Um, you like, it's become very, it's a cheesy sauce. You wouldn't be able to tell that this is not a cheesy sauce. It's like a bechamel. Sauce. Yeah. <laughs> Without the cream. Without the cream. All Maybe right, so we're gonna, Better. Leave that to the side and cook our okay. other, We're go, now other we're gonna, uh, the Swiss, ingredients. Next step is the Swiss chard. Maybe if we can heat up the pan. 
And so I'm just going to quickly strip this, the, the shard, I guess, pull the uh, leaves right off of the stems. Boom. Boom. Really good. If, didn't, if you didn't do any exercise that day, this is this fits the bill. There's muscles going. And then these are really good because if you use Swiss chard, it's, it's one of the really good greens, but it's also good because the stems are nice and soft. So you can actually use the sem stems in dish. I'll just cut off the bottom part like so. And then chop up the stems into pieces like this. And the stems take a little longer to cook than the leafy green part. So we give the stems a head start. And that would be true of like bok choy, Swiss chard, the leafy greens that have us put it in here. Right into our pan, put a little, we're going to throw a little veggie broth in there too to help it not uh, burn too much and just kind of cook them through until they get a little soft. Put it right back there into the stove and we uh, can see it a little bit. We're going to use there. a veggie broth for a little bit. You can make your own. You could use AJ's you could, you could use it from breakfast your, uh, veggie your drink. Drink this morning. And then we're going to take the rest of the shard, the leafy part, and just sort of cut it into little strips like so. This helps it cook down nicely. You could do whole leaf if you want, because it'll reduce. And it helps it cook a little more quickly. I'll certainly don't use any of our knife skills as, a, as an example, because we went to med school, not chef school. <laughs> could take off a mole, but I can't cut the uh, shard. So the shard goes in there with the stems. Get all the rest of that. And then that's really just, it's just sort of a, you know, a light, you know, heating through because, you know, there's going to be some moisture that comes out of the, out of the, out of the uh, shard and a little bit of broth at the bottom of the pan just to give it a little extra flavor and keep it from sticking. And you can add broth as you go if it seems like it's drying out. And then when it just kind of gets real wilted and softens, it's ready to be used in the dish. So, so there's no oil in this. Swiss chard, I gotta say, is a really nice, Swiss chard and spinach are good starting points for the greens, just because they're not, you know, kale can be a little tougher and you might want to cook it a little longer, but these two are really yummy when they get softened, they have like a sweetness and it's also very pretty, the rainbow kale, you can get the rainbow chard, you can get like the stems are different colors like yellow and red, very pretty. So we're going to cook that down, now we're going to do the beans while that's cooking down. This is a really easy part of the recipe, because all you need is a can of beans and we're using butter beans and you use your little your what, colander i'm going to drain these out make sure we got them all which we did give them a quick rinse rinsing helps um, remove some of the um, coating that sometimes is harder for some people to digest and can lead to excess gas so that's just one of the tips for um, helping with digestion the other thing we tell people when they get into eating beans is that, um, you know, a lot of people complain about the digestive part of it, that it's, uh, that they're hard to digest. And um, the smaller one, you know, you start smaller, so like lentils, small azuki beans, stuff like that will be easier to, to digest stuff like that. So these are just going to heat through, no fancy cooking here, just a low heat, just the beans, nothing else but the beans, because between the beans and the, and the, the greens and the greens and the sauce, Sauce really does the is the uh, is, does the trick. We already have our our black rice over here in Sue's. Can I push this down? Mm -hmm. In Sue's rice cooker. So it's hard to see because it's black, but it's mm -hmm. in there. Sometimes it looks it purple. The black rice can have a purple appearance. See, there's the black rice. It's very rich in antioxidants. It's a whole grain. Delicious. A lot of dishes, it's combined with other kinds of grains, brown rice. All right, I think our right. greens are looking good. They're looking kind of softened through. So now we're going to go ahead and plate. Yes. All so right. Fancy, fancy, fancy here. Black it's all rice. in the plating. It's all in the, you know, that's what I always say. It's all <laughs> in the plating. <laughs> all right. So we just make a little, little pile of rice. It's good. Oh, made a mess already. What are you gonna do? And then we're gonna do our B or greens first. Doesn't really matter, but uh, let's do the greens next. Okay. okay. Fancy thing here. So nice little, nice little pile on there. Mm. 
smells really good. Some of the little pieces, the little stems you can throw around. And one thing I want to point out is leafy greens um, for people who are plant-based is an important source of calcium and iron. And any acid will increase the absorption. So we have the lemon in our sauce when paired with the leafy greens really increases the calcium and iron absorption. And here are the butter beans just heated through. And these you can just kind of strew around. <laughs> strewing. I don't know if you should be strewing your beans. <laughs> <laughs> they are strewn. Okay. Thank you. And now we're going to go for some sauce here. All right. Turn in here around. Woo! Gotta go dish. back here. <laughs> people, I think people overcomplicate plant-based eating and thinking they need like a recipe. Oh, yeah. how easy is this? It doesn't get okay. any easier. And we're going to strew the sauce now. Yeah. Drizzles. Well, you guys really do a lot of strewing in Rhode Island, don't you? <laughs> hey, it's a small state. <laughs> you gotta find something to keep yourself busy. Uh, that looks delicious. Oh, good. Actually, really good. I love greens for breakfast, personally. Right. I gotta take We're a picture of We're gonna take a fork this. out and enjoy this. <laughs> that looks, that's the best strewing ever. <laughs> if we had a little, a little nice it's little paprika worthy. or smoked paprika on there, we'd give it a little, oh, little yeah. flare of color. Oh yeah, and sometimes I'm already we, digging in. Sometimes we do um, hemp seed, little hemp seeds. They're delicious, mm -hmm. give it a nice little crunchy texture. The cayenne's over here. Are we looking for cayenne? No, looking for oh, the, paprika. paprika. Mm. So good. So do all this. Would you like some hemp seeds? I would. This isn't saying it looks so yummy. I should yeah, have waited. You, know, wait, wait, you, wait, you don't want to overdo that. your your uh, your fancy schmancy because then it just gets yeah, turns into a <laughs> war zone. I wish you were here so you can taste it. Oh, it's, oh, it looks beautiful. You know what I've been sprinkling on everything is this product called Vegify, where it's dehydrated uh, beet, purple carrot, orange carrot, or cauliflower, because then it's like these little crunchy things like croutons, but it's actually vegetables. What and is it, great. Does it have a flavor to it or just, it's just it, it, has the, it has the flavor of, of the vegetables. So the cauliflower doesn't very taste very strong, but you can really taste the beet and the carrot. I, and I love it. Mm. And it makes it so pretty because it's like sprinkles that you would find on dessert, but it's vegetables because it comes in colors. So were there some questions you mentioned? Yeah, there was a couple of questions. I wrote them down. Uh, first, um, um, uh, um, Monica said, can you talk about that formula where you converted um, something grams, to, to grams to teaspoons? How does that work? So number of the grams of sugar. So for instance, if something has four grams of sugar, like a good example is, yeah. um, sorry, like yeah. Fanta soda. Yeah. A 20 ounce bottle of Fanta soda has 80 grams of sugar. You divide it by four, that's 20 teaspoons of sugar in a Fanta soda. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to drink Dr. Pepper every day and Coke Slurpees. That's been 20 years, but I mean, I never thought about it that way. You know, how much sugar it was. If you empty one of the bottles and you put that amount of sugar yeah. to show people how much of it is actually good, it's like a quarter of the bottle is just sugar, white table sugar. I think people, I think sugar is so addictive. Even I don't know the people that are able to moderate that. That's incredible. Uh, Karen saying that marketplace sounds amazing. I'd love to meet those people. The idea of that is fantastic. Yeah, and yeah. But Plant City, yeah, Plant yeah. City, it's, it's got four restaurants and four different restaurants, um, um, a- um, A tequila bar. A marketplace, yeah, kombucha bar. Kombucha. Who's the brainchild of that? Kim Anderson. Kim Anderson. I can introduce Anderson. you if you Yeah, I'd love to, that, that's incredible. Yeah, and- worked, um, He worked with yeah. a chef. Um, Luis? No, no, who was the um, guy? Oh. Um, like the whole concept. Michael uh, Ken? Kenny. 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 Oh, Matthew yeah. Kenny. Matthew Kenny. Kenny. Fabulous. Yeah. Nice. And so it's got Those are his meal. restaurants. Double Zero is his restaurant that he has. I think there might be one in LA at Double Zero. There's one mm -hmm. in Boston. Um, it's an it's the Italian um, fire grilled pizza. Delicious. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, there's a question from Susanna. How, what, what's involved in getting certified in lifestyle medicine? Is it a specialty only for medical doctors or can anybody get certified in lifestyle medicine? Anybody can, well, you have to have some sort of a certification, um, whether you could be a nutritionist, you could be um, a physician, you could do it out as a resident, but the tracks are different depending on sort of where your jump off point is. And um, for, for us, for us physicians, we need 30 um, credits of CME over a 
two year period, I think. Three years. Three years. And then you need to pass sit for the boards for lifestyle medicine. And that would be sort of, you know, that's when you, when you, once you pass the boards, you're certified as a lifestyle medicine. Um, if you go physician. on American College of Lifestyle yeah. Medicine, org or whatever their yeah. website i think it's actually aclm.org mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, they have all the tracks on the website mm -hmm. you can look it up how hard was the test compared to like all the other no, tests i haven't mm -hmm. taken it we're we're done with the cme and we're on our way to studying for the boards right now yeah oh so i was gonna ask you what are some of the questions like oh so you haven't done it yet how they're mostly that? well some of the sample questions it's mostly sort of case-based so a patient with hypertension diabetes comes to you and is interested in you know um, so and so, and it's just not, it's not only plant-based or diet. It's also based on other vitals of lifestyle medicine, like sleep, um, stress level, exercise. Uh, um, exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort Quitting of smoking, right? It comprises the whole lifestyle that we are all trying to encourage our patients to follow, not just their eating habits. So. Great, thanks. Okay, so here's a doctory type question for any of you from Rosanna. Can you comment on oxalates and calcium absorption? Ooh. Wow, Sandy, is that going to be on the board? I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, not, I'm uh, not sure. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's something that's that. so specific. We'd have to kind of look into it. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm thinking that this person is asking about stones, right? Calcium oxalate, kidney stone, stones. Kidney stones. Or, um, I think there's certain vegetables that are high in oxalates yeah. and can compete with cal calcium mm -hmm. absorption. Um, yeah. But some, you know, sometimes in our classes, we get very smart people you know, coming through that will ask questions. And we always like do our research and look at the evidence-based um, mm -hmm. you know, behind it and get back to people mm -hmm. and send out an email. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, if that's one of those ones. <laughs> if your viewer wants to um, pose that question on our website, we'll be happy to research it. And, and great. Thank you. Could you please do that, Rosanna? That would be amazing. Um, so Plant Based Wife says, does Canada have any programs like this where somebody could get she's an RN where somebody could be certified in lifestyle medicine? Or is it only if you live in the United States? Oh, oh I think it's international. Yeah, I think it is international. And so a, a nurse could become certified then. It, yes. You don't have to be an MD. That's fantastic. I love it. Here's a question on baking from Meadow. When you bake things on aluminum foil, does it have negative health effects? Should we always use parchment paper? I use a silicone baking pan. Yeah, mm -hmm. we always use parchment I'm paper. I'm not, I mean, you know, we would lean towards parchment paper or silicone, but I'm not like aware of like any reports or studies that shows that the use of aluminum foil has been like detrimental in any mm -hmm. sort of way. So- not sure, a lot, but a lot of people do the parchment and then do the aluminum. So I don't know. Yeah. You know, just to, if I can just comment quickly, um, a lot of times, you know, we do get very specific questions about these things and, you know, we like to sort of step back and just say, Hey, you know what, you're completely overhauling the way you're eating, you know, whether you have too much oxalate or whether you have too much aluminum in your, or whether you're buying organic, we, we would urge organic buying, but you know, not everybody buys organic, which is fine because we don't want, we just want people to not be living on like Taco Bell and Wendy's and moving towards these foods that we're teaching. I know people get so like wrapped up in the minutia. Like, you know, I'll, I've had clients come to me, they're like, you know, hundred pounds overweight. And then they worry about like, well, I can't use a microwave. And it's like, yeah, but we got other things that are more important first, you know? Very true. And there's so much information out there. There's so much people get hung up on and distracted. It's like, you know, like just eat the daily dozen and use the food, the plate method and you'll be, you'll be, you'll be okay. Absolutely. Well, gosh, I wish we had a trio of plant-based doctors here that people could go to. I mean, there are a few, but that would be so cool. You're, you're in LA, right? I was in LA and then I moved to the desert for three years and now I'm in Northern California and I'm actually moving again today. So I, Chef oh. A is always on the move. That's why we did this show so early, but I'm going to stay in the Northern California area. Yeah, LA was great for plant-based doctors. Oh my God. That's what I say. Every time I'm sick, I'm like, God, I sure miss Dr. Artal. He was a quadruple board certified vegan doctor at Cedar sinai one of the best hospitals, boy. Wow. That's one thing. I didn't like LA, but I did like the medical care there. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. We need more out here. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Susanna wants to know, what are the healthy guidelines for sodium content and processed foods? Is this which well we use that quick we have yeah. another quick roll for quick quick yeah. roll for sodium yeah mm -hmm. it should be less than the amount of calories per serving that's just a kind of like yeah. rule of thumb i think that i think the guideline and if somebody should double check it but 
if somebody's hypertensive and they're trying to control their sodium intake, I think 2,000 to yeah. 2,500 milligrams a day is, you don't want more right. than that. And that's, you know, and a lot of times people get, get, you know, hung up on the salt shaker, like, oh, I don't do that. But a lot of times you really have to look at the labels of the foods you yeah. buy, because that's where they sneak all the sodium in to make it taste so good. Yeah, that's you know, like a, a can of soup, you know, a lot of times they're um, very high sodium. And, and that trick is just a quick one yeah. to try to, you know, keep it under the number of calories. Right, for sure. Yeah. Well, here's the question that every guest on Chef AJ Live gets, even if they're not vegan. Everybody wants to know what y'all eat in a day. <laughs> That's funny. I eat this a lot. I do make this a lot. I always have granola for breakfast and my granola recipe. I made oh on, on Chef AJ um, a few days ago, and I have it on my YouTube channel. Um, and I usually do leftovers from dinner mm -hmm. that are repurposed for lunch into a salad. Um, and how about you guys? So, I, well, Steve and I, we, our desks are next to each other at the, the office, office, so we're always like, what do you have? What do I have? <laughs> so I mean, so I, can, I, I can tell you what Sue eats every day. She can tell you what you, all right, you tell, you tell them what Sue I eat. Sue usually has a really nice, beautiful looking greens based fresh salad kind of situation going on. Sometimes she'll get like a really good vegan burger and heat that up and put it on top. Some kind um, of top vegan top. Always has some, some grapes and some other fruits during the day. Yeah, yeah. that's so, sort of oh, what I'm about me. So Steve, Steve actually, we have a little, <laughs> mini, little mini, mini toaster, mini kitchen in our office, thank, thankfully. And he will bring all of his ingredients uncooked <laughs> and he will cook it. In the um, toaster oven. in the toaster oven, so he'll cut up his sweet potato. Sweet potato. He's got his beets or his yeah. um, tomatoes that a lot of his patients wow. bring. Fresh tomatoes, they bring it for him from their garden, and then he'll have some kind of a grain, and yeah. he'll he'll cut up all the um, the root vegetables, and he'll put it in the toaster, and he'll at make. 11, yeah, and so you can smell it in the office. And then at noon. <laughs> Boom, Dang, that's lunchtime, awesome. yeah, fresh cooked that. vegetables. Wow, from scratch. From yes. scratch. Yes. That's, that's, that's his lunch. lunch. <laughs> Have any of you been able to influence other doctors to become plant-based or more plant-based or incorporate that in their practices? Well, my, my, my husband is a physician and I'm still trying, I, you probably read it in my bio, I'm still trying to convince him that this is the way to go, <laughs> but have not succeeded yet. What, that. what do you think his resistance is? He loves, he loves his steaks, loves his steaks. Well, what kind of, what, what's his specialty? Oh, he's an interventional radiologist. He's fixing the heart disease. Yeah, he's fixing <laughs> the circulatory problems. Well, has he seen game changers or forks yes, over yes, and, yes. and he still well, won't, well, you, I hope you don't make him the meat, make him make his own. Oh, no, 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 I don't. But, you know, he has said <laughs> since I, he's sort of, you know, um, since I've become plant-based, he feels much better. And when he doesn't eat, what I cook, he goes, I don't enjoy my meals anymore because of you, because you've made you, you know, you've made me plant-based 50% and my body doesn't feel good when I don't, when I don't eat your food. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and of our 160 people that have gone through the program, I think I can only think of three who were MDs. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so it's hard we're to, hoping it's, to get more. It's hard to change doctors the way they think in the practice. Yeah. That's really hard. I think it's hard to change anybody, even if they're not a doctor, but doctors are smart. So show them the data. Yeah, but yeah. It, doctors are smart and comfortable with things that they feel like they have a good handle on. I mean, how do you get someone to start teaching how to eat vegan? It's just such a way out of left field for most doctors. It's really hard to do. It's unfortunate that most people come to this after some kind of health crisis. It's not prophylactically. Very true. And you know, I, I've talked a lot about with my patients, like, a lot of people that are in their like 30s or 40s and they're starting to, you know, the weight's coming on and the blood pressure's creeping up and the blood sugar's creeping up and cholesterol's creeping up. And that's when they're kind of like in this decision. In the, the fork the, in the, the road. The fork in the road, the, the decision decade, like 30s, you know? It's like, which way do I want to, how do I want to age? Do I want to age healthy and energized and feeling good? Or do I want to age, you know, with more and more pills and more and more treatments? And so sometimes that inspires them, but also they're inspired when I tell them that their kids you know, who are like, you know, five years old, four years old, instead of eating chicken nuggets and pizza strips and that kind of stuff every day, they can start to eat, you know, this way, or at least be exposed to it so that they can get some idea of how, what it looks like to eat more healthy. Yeah. Um, Meadow says, is there a way for the public who may not be from Rhode Island to support your organization or even work with you? If it, like you could do remote things, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. our jumpstart in September is remote and our um, the jumpstart in October has 20 remote slots plus the um, cancer class in October is all remote. Um, we are a nonprofit, um, but we're not quite set up yet to take donations. We will be a 501c3 um, by the end of the year. Um, yeah, so we're looking to grow because we're newly established. We started in 2019, but we became a nonprofit this year. And, and certainly if you have any friends or family members who you think would be interested or would benefit from this kind of change in lifestyle, we would be more than happy to have them come and join us for one of our Jumpstart programs. And we also, you know, um, we have um, medical students, residents, and PA students that are that that are also interested in you know plant-based lifestyle and they are coming to work with us. They volunteer their time. You know they come to the classes. They take blood pressures. Um, they help with um, setting up the website. All those types of things. Um, we are always looking for if anyone's interested and we can give a little bit of education and show you what we do in return. If you want to volunteer time or your skills or your talent, we'd love to have you. Mm -hmm. Uh, sounds great. Nancy says you need to come further north like New Hampshire, hint, hint. <laughs> we had somebody from, was it Maine, who virtually did the program? Yeah, New Hampshire's not that far away. Yeah, nice. try it out. <laughs> we'll find a place um, so the question from Susanna, how do you docs treat those with elevated triglycerides that just won't come down? That, that won't come down despite eating, if she's saying that won't come down despite eating a you know, a really healthy, uh, you know. Yeah, she didn't follow that. I know Dr. McDougall says cut the fruit down when that happens, but. Uh, yeah, um, ground flax seeds, I don't know if she's already doing that, is um, helpful in helping to lower um, triglycerides as well and alcohol. No alcohol. We yeah. don't, you know, we don't harp on that too much, but that's a huge one for triglycerides. Yeah. Agreed. Interesting. I did not know that. Well, Sometimes that. triglycerides um, are, it's familial, it's right. genetic and um so you have to figure it out. But this is always the first place to go is with your diet and alcohol and then. And, and right. if, the rest, if the rest of the lipid panel looks okay, like the total cholesterol, the LDL, the HDL, if those look okay, triglycerides, you know, they're supposed to be, I think, less than 150. So if you like, you know, if you're in like 200, 225, it's considered a little bit less of a predictor of heart disease nowadays than it used to be where we used to have over, you know, over 150, it was like, boom, they were on a medication mm -hmm. right away. So now it's not as much of a concern. Now, if it gets up into the 500, 600, 700 range, then it really needs to be addressed for other reasons, but. That is great. There's a question on HDL, LDL. Mm -hmm. uh, what I just saw it from Janet. If LDL and HDL are equal at 110, do they, do they equal out each other? I've been told one is good and one is bad. If, but if both high, do I not have to worry about it if total cholesterol is 210? Great question. So, um, so LDL is the bad cholesterol, HDL is the good cholesterol. It gives a protective um, uh, to your arteries. It protects your arteries from plaque buildup. And so what you wanna actually see is an HDL, it doesn't have to be equal to LDL, it just needs to be higher than 40 to give it a protective effect. Um, the LDL um, should be less than 100. If you have chronic diseases like diabetes, um, it should be less than 70. Um, but nowadays, there's also a algorithm that we use to uh, measure what's called um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, fact, risk. And it's an algorithm that uses not just your cholesterol levels, but it also uses your age, um, your other chronic conditions like diabetes, whether you're a smoker. And um, it gives you a risk score after you put those um, factors in. So it's no longer just looking at the levels or the numbers of your cholesterol levels. You need to sort of factor in the whole person, the whole patient. Mm -hmm. So when, if you talk to your doctor and they talk to you and they say, oh, your LDL is high, you should also ask them about a um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score. Ask them to calculate that out for you. But if your patient had an, had an HDL of 110. Oh, that's great. Fabulous. Right. Mm -hmm. Would you treat if her LDL is no, 110? No. no. You should no, not. Sure. So yeah. Definitely not. There's yeah. also something called the total cholesterol to HDL mm -hmm. ratio, which is an important number. And that's when you take the total cholesterol. So let's say, um, was it Janet? Sorry, it the, two, name, two uh, the name of the person. Is like, but when you, when you take the total cholesterol, let's say someone has a 200, a cholesterol, total cholesterol of 200, and their HDL is 50. So they have a three to one total cholesterol to, I'm oh, sorry, 
So her four, her four to one total cholesterol mm -hmm. to HDL ratio, which is very good. So you want that number to be low. So her ratio is two. Yeah, so her ratio, Sandy just calculated, is two. Her total cholesterol to HDL ratio is two. So okay. she's- She's fine. She's great. Well, I, I, I'm not a doctor, but the way the analogy has been taught to me is that when that one of the one of the L the HDL, I believe, is, is the garbage trucks, and if you don't have garbage, you don't need garbage trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense, like for a lay person? <laughs> it does, but you, the HDL, high HDL. So one of the patterns we see a lot, and it's related to all these questions, we see a lot of high triglycerides, low HDL. That's, there's something called the metabolic syndrome which has that as one of its, you know, cardinal, you know, uh, descriptors. But um, so we see people that have a lot of high triglycerides and low HDL. And, you know, you want to kind of reverse that. And this kind of diet is perfect for reversing that, lowering triglycerides, raising HDL, and, uh, you know, giving you much better numbers and better risk so factors. Cutting out the oil is, is an important part. A lot of people come to us thinking they're doing it, you know, right, but they're not cutting out the oil. When you really dive into it, they're getting it in all these hidden places they don't realize. Yeah, like restaurants, for example. Oh, exactly. Forget, yeah. forget about it. You can't go to restaurants. <laughs> I, I don't. Oh, but you know what? Since I moved here, I actually got three restaurants to make food chef AJ style. I mean, they're big, as long as I call them 24 hours in advance, one 12 hours in advance, they'll make my food because tomorrow is my 45th anniversary of becoming vegan. So we're celebrating in a restaurant and it's, oh. uh, yeah, I know. Can you believe it? I've been vegan longer than I think uh, Dr. Lee's been alive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think so. You guys, well, you guys are great. Thank you. I just wish you were closer, you know? Well, we're there. Our hearts are there. Yeah. It would be fun. This was so much fun. Feel free to come back anytime. You guys are a, a, just a, a joy. And I'm so uh, thrilled at the work you're doing in the tiniest state in the United States. Go Rhode Island, little roadie. That is so cute. Anyway, thank you so much. This was a fabulous presentation, cooking demonstration, and I wish you every success in your Plant Docs venture, and I hope more people will find out about you. All the links to you guys are right below in the show notes, and then Dr. Musial's show is also going to be posted there as well. Good luck on your move, on your move today. Thank you. We're actually just moving the boxes. I mean, we have, we're in a rental, so we're, I'm not like... A, but all the boxes are going from storage. It's a, it's a crazy long story, my life, but we'll save that for another show. So thank you. It was kind of fun doing this early because now I got the whole day ahead of me. Good. Enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Plant Docs. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. And thanks all of you for coming up so bright and early to watch another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for my 45th vegan anniversary when I'll have two fabulous guests at 11 a.m. from the ACLM, which is the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Dr. Michelle Tolifson, who's going to be talking about insights from the Blue Zones. And at 2 p.m. from the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Michael Roizen, who's actually Dr. Esselstyn's boss with a brand new book about how to reboot your age. Take care, everyone.